My name is Milu Hofhorst and I'm a PhD candidate at the HCX project for two years now. Uh, before I started that, I studied pharmacy in the Netherlands. Uh, so I was trained as a pharmacist. And during that time, I already figured that I really loved the, the pharmacoeconomic side of, of my uh, occupation. And therefore I started a master in, uh, in Rotterdam uh, on health economics. Um, and based on this background, I applied for this uh, vacancy that was uh, online just when I graduated. So uh, yeah, two years ago, I started in this project and my research in the HTX project uh, mostly focuses on the uh, policies around HTA and in particular on uh, complex uh, HTAs. This project was initiated because the, the landscape of HCA, so the process of how to reimburse uh, a new therapy, uh, is changing lately uh, over the past decades, I, I should say. So, uh, for example, the therapies are changing. So from uh, single therapies, uh, we're moving towards the more complex therapies and combinations of therapies and devices that are added or uh, e-health technologies, etc. And on top of that, uh, besides just the randomized control trials that are uh, usually done, uh, we more and more see data on uh, uh, yeah, what we call real-world data on how treatments work in real life. So from patient, re patient registries, for example. And uh, another trend is that uh, uh, in those RCTs, back in the days, <laughs> back in the days, so it's still uh, used, of course, but there we looked at a more general population, uh, whereas over time, shifting towards individual and personalized medicine and uh, making treatment decisions really based on a small uh, patient group. Um, and this also affects, of course, the reimbursement decision. So it, it becomes more difficult to say who should receive a treatment and who shouldn't. Um, and because of these more difficulties, you also see that things are uh, getting more diverse and there are starting to become initiatives uh, to harmonize these, these uh, reimbursement decisions to uh, HCA organizations start to, to work together and to cooperate uh, to make the most optimal decisions, let's say, and to uh, reduce workload. So this project, to be sure, is uh, a project that focuses on uh, development of methods that can deliver more customized information uh, on the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of complex and personalized therapies. My work is focusing on the policy research, uh, so not so much on the diehard method development, but more the policies around it and how to implement it, for example. So the first topic uh, that I worked on in, uh, in the past two years was uh, on the challenges experienced by European HDA organizations. So the question that we wanted to answer was, which uh, uh, therapies do HDA organizations actually think that are the most complex to decide on for reimbursement? So we disseminated a questionnaire and this looks maybe rather complex, uh, I just, put this in my slides to show you some of the questions that, that we asked, because that will help uh, interpreting the results uh, uh, in the next slides. So we send out a questionnaire to HDA organizations all over Europe. Um, and here we ask, for example, which, literally ask like, which therapies do you perceive as most complex? Uh, and this questionnaire was, uh, uh, responded to a lot. So we had a response rate of 67%. And well, that's actually quite high. Uh, usually that's somewhere between 20 and 30%. But I think the organizations also felt this is quite an important topic. So if you assess this case study, did you think it was complex? And if yes, what was it that was complex? So was it in the methods that you had to use? Was it in the policies around this? Um, uh, uh, reimbursement decision? Was it the data that you had to work with or uh, were there any other challenges or did you think that it was not? The most challenging 
uh, uh, was a treatment which they call a tumor agnostic treatment. So that's really targeted at, for example, one protein that can be expressed in various different tumors. So it could work for, uh, let's say, uh, a lung uh, cancer, but also for uh, uh, intestinal uh, carcinomas, etc. But that makes it very difficult to to assess because you don't know which patient population you exactly uh, have to choose. So that was the one that they thought was most complex. Um, I will not go into detail uh, for the other case studies, but what this slide really shows is that most of these organizations initially said, well, it was the methods that we figured were very difficult. So everything that's green that you see, uh, th those are all the answers that where they said, the methods here were uh, complex, what made it complex. When, when you have to decide on reimbursements, they usually do that in two different steps. So first they look at the relative effectiveness of a treatment compared to other treatments. And second, they look at the cost effectiveness. So the RIA and the CIA stand for the relative effectiveness uh, assessment and the cost effectiveness assessment. So uh, we distinguish in that because we figure that it might be due to, well, the effectiveness of the drug itself or more to the modeling and reimbursement related methods that they use. But there wasn't a clear distinction between those two. Um, and it was, yeah, co those combined because it was both about the methods. We could say that more than half of these uh, um, challenges, the HA organization said that it was due to the methods in either one of the two stages of HGA. Okay. But then, interestingly, uh, if we followed up on that. So while well, you said the methods are complex, can you explain what exactly was it uh, in those methods that was complex? So they had to uh, write a piece of text and explaining why this was complex. Then we assessed it uh, uh, yeah, based on different categories. And we started with looking at, okay, if they say this uh, or that, is this related to a data issue? or is it not related to a data issue? And that if we combined everything that they mentioned in our questionnaire, you can see that two thirds of all their reasons that they provided for why HGA is complex was related to data issues. So that's the orange part in this graph that looks rather complex, but well, it, yeah, it's just in the first circle, you see our first categorization. So was it data related or not data related? We further specified that, uh, which you can see in more other layers. Um, so two thirds of these arguments were actually data related. And of course, this, this starts with the data, but this continues into the whole process of HTA. So if you don't have the proper data, then probably during the relative effectiveness assessment, you will find troubles because you don't have the data to decide on that. And then Usually that will be the input for the cost effectiveness assessment. And if this first part wasn't right, or you missed some data, then of course the second part also misses a few points. And then if you have to make a decision, this will also be very complicated because you're just not sure about everything. Um, and the most arguments that they gave were, were literally that the data was either immature or limited. This, these were literally the words that they used. So they limited, I, I think mostly they meant that some data points that they wanted were not there uh, or that a study was uh, stopped too, too soon that they actually wanted to have a, a longer follow-up time, for example. Um, and quite a share of these arguments related to the quality of life, uh, quality of life data so that all yeah, all the information that they needed to, to go with that, to work with that, uh, was just not there. So that's quite interesting. So I think we can conclude from this study is that most of these challenges in HCA stem from insufficient data and that continues to uh, uh, create difficulties uh, further up 
in the process, uh, which explains why they all said that it were methodological difficulties that they experienced. Uh, but I think if you really look at the, the start of the problem, it's, it's because the data is not there. So this brings us to the second part of our questionnaire and also to our second topic where we looked a bit more deeper in these data and well, in these challenges in which circumstances then would you use real world data. So real world data that's defined uh, in this survey as everything that's not a randomized control trial. So for example, patient registries or um, clinical uh, opinions, uh, or expert opinions, uh, etc. So uh, what we wanted to know is like in which circumstances would you be most willing to use those additional data sources uh, to increase your certainty on the decision that you need to make. Uh, and I think this is interesting uh, because there is an increasingly complex nature of treatments, as I explained in the beginning. And uh, we uh, really wanted to know the practical experiences from the European HD organizations on this. Uh, and the overarching aim for this was to guide future method development. So if we know in which circumstances they are willing to use that, then we also have a direction on, well, for which circumstances should we develop our methods? So, as I said, this brings us to topic two, acceptance of real world data in challenging HTA. And this is all data from the same questionnaire. So you see the same picture as before. And I, uh, again, showed this to tell you a bit about the questions that we asked. So, for example, we asked uh, which data sources in general they do accept. Um, also, what the reasons are if they do not accept certain uh, data sources. And uh, lastly, about the um, circumstances where they uh, would be willing to accept real world data where they do not yet do that. Um, so the first question is, which data sources uh, do you accept? You see that the, the top three were all based on, on the randomized control trials. So systematic reviews and meta-analysis are usually based on randomized control trials and all HDA organizations do accept that. So that's no big surprise. Then for all the other sources, so that's for how we define real world data sources, there's at least one organization that does not accept uh, that. So quite a lot of organizations do look at patient registries uh, if necessary. Um, but for the case reports and unpublished data, editorials, expert opinions, uh, it's not even half of the organizations uh, that accept those type of data. And um, I think it's, Depends the way you look at it. You could also say, well, one third does actually look at that, which is quite good. So it, yeah, it, it depends is your class half full or half empty. Uh, and it also depends, of course, on the situation and what, yeah, what kind of data you need in addition to real world um, or uh, RCTs, for example. But I think there is some improvement uh, possible here. Uh, so, as in, as you could see in the, in the previous slide, that most organizations have some data sources that they do not accept. We wanted to know what the reasons were for not accepting these data sources. Um, and in the legend here, you can see on the top, uh, it starts with the, the, the reason, like the most important reason, and uh, on the bottom is the least important reason. So the most important reason is that the data sources that are necessary, so the real world data sources that they want to use are not there, uh, which is a quite obvious reason for not using it if it's not there. So they actually wanted to use it, but it wasn't there. Uh, the second important reason uh, was that existing policy structures or information governance or well, in an HD organization, your boss saying you cannot use this, for example, so that the data was there, but they were not allowed to use it, which I also think is quite an obvious reason for not using it. And then 
other reasons like uh, uh, a lack of knowledge within the organization of do you know how to deal with the methods or statistics to use this data or do you have the financial uh, resources to uh, to use this type of data those were considered the least important uh, so it really seems that it's again in in the data and the policies around the data that are most important for uh, not using it yeah it's, it's a rather complex chart maybe but uh i think if you just because it's just a ranking so you don't you also don't know like they have to put one reason on top of the other so maybe they actually think it's equal but they have to choose of course so i think if you look at the overall reason from most important to least important which you can see in the legend that would provide you with the most valuable information so yes. uh just read it from top to bottom and then you have a rough indication of how they uh, rate these reasons. Yeah, and also if the bar is really long, so what you can see in uh, in, in the lacking rel uh, relevant available registries or uh, long time to, to uh, it takes a long time before you can access this data, that this is rated very differently among the organizations. Mm. You can see that some put it on one and others put it on nine. So yes. there's there's really no consensus on <laughs> how you should rate this. But I think if you look at the, the, the first and the last reason, that gives you an indication of what's important and what's not. So I think in the middle, yeah, that I think if you would have picked other people within the organizations that these orders of the middle reasons might have be slightly different. Uh, so therefore, I, I interpret this mostly looking at like the, the top two and the, and the last two, so to say. Okay, clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, so next up, we uh, asked them like, in which circumstances uh, where you at this point do not accept real data, where which circumstances would increase your likelihood to accepting it? So where is it most necessary to, to use those real world data? Um, and well, we provided them with a lot of reasons that they could rank from one to five. So one was uh, we would not accept it ever. And uh, five was we would definitely accept it in this uh, situation. And I think most important from this graph is that, of course, it starts on, on the top with orphan uh, uh, drugs, where I think 4.3 out of 5 is quite a high score that most organizations would use real data there. But if you look at the lowest few scores, that's still 3.2, 3.3, .3, uh, 3.4. And if, if you look at the 3.2 out of 5, that's still quite high. So what I, the, the message that I, take from this graph is that actually most organizations in these circumstances are willing to use real world data. So the first at the bottom, the real world data only available from other countries outside your region. For you, is this a data related issue or is it a policy related issue? If the policy of the agency in the country or of the agency or the, the, the way uh, HTA is organized or the, leg the legal situation um, excludes the possibility that they can use data outside of the, of the country, let's say, uh, or impose to use real world data only from data sources which are national. That is, that would be more a policy related difficulty to use mm -hmm. data than a real difficulty to to use them right yeah i, I don't know if i'm clear but um, <clears throat> from from the different difficulties here to use real world data uh, do you also explore which ones could be improved uh, by changing some local policies is that something that can be also envisaged mm -hmm. so we we included this um, because, of course, in the H6 project, that's a European-wide project, and there are uh, 
well, besides the really high income countries, also the more middle income countries. And we wanted to assess whether it's more likely to accept real world data from more, how to say it, likewise countries or neighboring countries, which are maybe more similar to each other than, for example, from countries all the way on the other side of Europe. Uh, and we wanted to see whether there was a difference uh, between that. So you can also see somewhere in the middle, it says that real world data that's only available in other countries within your region. So that's, for example, the Netherlands accepting data from Germany, uh, which are of course neighbors, that they rank that a bit higher than outside the region. And I think it's, I think there are no such policies saying, well, you can and you cannot accept data from that or that country. I think policies are not specific like that. I think it's more a matter of trust that we need to build to, to trust the data that comes from countries that are not your directly neighbors or cooperating country, for example. So I think it's, it's partly a policy issue and it's more like a also maybe from tradition and background that they never use data from a, a country quite far away. So why, why would they now? Uh, so I think it's more uh, related to that. So to conclude, um, I think it's, still think it's a rather positive uh, result. So most HA organizations uh, do already use uh, various real world data sources um and if they do not accept it uh it, it seems it's more out of necessity because data is not there or there are some policy structures that need to change before they can use it um and the most complex circumstances where they are willing it uh, willing to use it are for example the orphan therapies single arm trials uh, or atmps which are increasingly present um and if you look at this, I think in the future, we will need to find structural ways to collect global data. So solving the issue of data being not available. Also to find trustworthy ways to implement it uh, regarding all the policy structures and policies, yeah, reducing the, the use of global data. Uh, so we, we need to look at how to collect it and how to implement the use uh, of global data. That's our I think the two most important uh, future directions.